Hello everyone, this is Jimmy and welcome to episode 25 of FTB Interactions. Before we get started today, I want to say that there has been a few requests for world downloads and uh, as a result, I will be making one available at the end of this episode. The link should be in the description. If it isn't, I forgot. So, um, yeah, look there for it. And right, with that, let's get into today's stuff. I wanted, well, last episode, I wanted to start making these 64k ME storage components, or at least auto-crafting them, and auto-crafting all the other bits for auto-crafting, right? You want to teach your auto-crafter how to auto-craft itself. That's how the uh, robot revolution begins. So we took a extremely long detour to get platinum. Was it necessary? Not at all. Was it fun though? Yes, it was. So we took a detour to go kill the chaos dragon and uh, now we have plenty of platinum among other things. So with that, I think we are ready to make the 64K ME storage component. This is a good opportunity to also set up all the machines that we need to make these components on our ME system. So a lot of these are done in various assemblers with different fluids and each assembler fluid combo, I will dedicate a single assembler to. So there will be a hydrochloric acid assembler. There will be a redstone assembler. I'm sure there's plenty of other tasks that have been run in assemblers with different fluids, right? This one, there will be a, uh, I'll probably use rubber. It will be a rubber assembler for covering cables, so on and so forth. So we'll start from the 1K storage component and work our way up from there. So for this, as I mentioned, we need a, an assembler with redstone, an assembler with rubber for copper cables. These processors, I'm still not sure if I want to make them on demand or not. They're a little slow, but for now, let's make them on demand. We'll revisit it later if it turns out we need, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands. But if we only need like 1,000, then it's okay to wait a while. Anyways, a hydrochloric acid assembler. This is a compressor and a precision. These are both in precision laser engravers. All right, that's a lot of machines just to get started. Did you ever notice that the names for Greg Tech assemblers are very weird? They're like almost all assembly assembling machines basic assembly machine advanced advanced two but suddenly the iv one is a assembler four or it's an assembler iv i'm not sure but and then it changes back to the normal naming scheme so i guess that that's a four not an iv like why is this one an assembler i will never know anyways uh i'm going to register all the recipes as well for for all these machines because i can guarantee you this is not the last time we will need an hv assembler one inconvenience of using applied energistics as opposed to logistic pipes is that when you import a recipe it doesn't ask you which which one you want put here by default now i could turn this on and when i go to craft it'll understand that it can use the other processor it can use the uh nano processor however it won't go auto craft nano processors it won't search down the crafting tree for them so the better idea is to, well, it's no harm in leaving it on, but um, you'll have to go and replace this with a nanoprocessor. The thing is, if you just did this and you don't know the name of the replacement processor, like what, how, how are you supposed to, you have to click this again to pull this up and look at it until you find the name of that. I liked how in OmniFactory, the, the circuits were explicitly tiered, right? So you could search for, this would be what, the HV circuit? So this would be a tier three circuit. You could search tier three and it would have this circuit as well as the nano processor in the tooltip. That was a neat feature, but uh, alas. It's not that big a deal. It just means I have to do a couple more clicks to register these recipes. One trick I like to do when setting up my machines is to name the interface that will be connected to the machine something, you know, logical. Now for stuff like the lathe or the polarizer, it's less necessary because that's just a name that will show up here in your interface terminal. And the name lathe or polarizer kind of makes sense. Although this by default is sorted alphabetically. So this will be an advanced lathe too. Whereas it'll be sorted with the A's, not the L's. So in that sense, it's still good to name them. But especially once you start doing assemblers, you kind of want to tell it what voltage tier your assembler is and what, most importantly, what fluid is in your assembler. So you just name the interface appropriately. So I will name this one lathe. And what I'm also going to do is always just put the voltage afterwards. That way, uh, 
for one, it's easier to tell that HV is HV as opposed to advanced two is HV. Likewise, I will name the polarizer. This will be a polarizer HV. Yeah, and I know I'm renaming items at 270 plus levels. Sue me. When setting up these machines, there's a couple ways to get the final product out of the machine back into the interface. Now, rewind a bit. Getting the inputs out of the interface and into the machine is trivially easy if these machines are just single input and N outputs, right? Like the polarizer. You get items in, items out. Or the lathe. Items in and N items out. It gets trickier if you want to distribute it for processing across multiple machines, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Now, for getting items out, there's a couple ways to do it. So, the way I've done before is just an item conduit like this. However, the downside is an item conduit, while it's not slow, it's also not incredibly fast, especially not without speed upgrades. So I figured, let's take advantage of the natural abilities of Greg Tech machines to auto-output. To do so, you need to choose the output side with your wrench. So you want the output side to face the interface, so you hit that. However, Greg Tech machines by default do not accept output, or do not accept input, rather, from their output side. So you have to hit the output side with the screwdriver to tell it, hey, accept output from there. But for some reason, the screwdriver does not have the same right-click behavior as all the other tools do. Right, like every other tool, you can hit these four like rectangles here, and they behave as if you hit the corresponding side. So hitting this counts as hitting the top. The screwdriver, you have to actually hit the side. So what you do is you just wrench the output to a side that you can see, hit it with the screwdriver until it says allow input from output side. I think there's only two states. And then uh, wrench it back to the side that you want. So I'm going to do the same here allow input from output side. And the reason that this one was orange and this one isn't is because I haven't turned it on yet. All right, back there like that. And then now when we, uh, or one last step, plug in your interfaces. And now we should be able to head back to our interface terminal and see those two interfaces. Let's check out that. Yep, lathe HV and Polarizer HV. I'm going to go ahead, go around to all these other interfaces I have laying around and turn off the show on interface terminal because they're not for on-demand crafting. Interfaces that you don't use for on-demand crafting, it's convenient if you don't have too many of them already strewn everywhere to turn off this so that they don't clutter your interface terminal. And much better. Now this is far less cluttered. So into the lathe, we put our lathe recipes. That is how to make steel rods and stainless steel rods. Into the polarizer, we put our magnetic steel rod recipe. So now when we go and order assemblers, order four of them, it should, yep, it'll say, hey, I don't have enough magnetic steel rods, but I can craft them. Now what it doesn't know how to make yet are steel cables because I haven't made an assembler for that. So let's craft one assembler. Uh oh, that's more bytes than we have, huh? Well, that's awkward. My solution for now is to handcraft one 16k storage. We can upgrade this. And I wonder, can we extract this as well? We can. That gives you your 1k component pack as well as your crafting unit. Not that those are particularly valuable resources, but uh, it's not like we need a 1k crafting CPU anymore. Anyways, now let's try about making that assembler again. Aha! So now that we have a 16k crafting CPU, this works. And it's off to the races. We can, in fact, I should add more crafting coprocessors to our uh, bass assembler there to make this go faster. But that wasn't all that bad. And the end result is one HV assembler. So we'll use this to cover our cables. As for naming, like I mentioned before, it'll be a assembler HV with rubber. Don't worry, there is an A there, it just doesn't fit on the screen. That way I can, at a glance, in my terminal, see that, oh yes, this is the one that covers cables. Oh, uh, in fact, I should actually put one more piece of information on this, and that is the ID chip that's in there, or the program circuit. So, because I'm using this to make 1x cables, I believe all 1x cables are made with program circuit 24. So I should actually include that. So it's assembler HV rubber 24. There we go. Uh, maybe the, let's put the number before the fluid. No, fluid before number. 
end of the day, that doesn't really matter. Setting up assemblers requires typically an extra step because you have to give them the fluid export bus to keep them stacked with fluids. There's a trick you can do if you only want like one bucket of stuff in here involving making a tiny little subnet to measure the amount of fluid in here. But for, for like 99.9% .9 of fluids, it really doesn't matter if you have one bucket sitting in an assembler or 64 buckets. They're cheap enough. So I will probably not bother with it unless we have to make an assembler with like neutronium somewhere down the line. So now I just need a program circuit for this. And this should be on, whoopsies, you have to craft it into a program circuit. Set it to 24. And we're good to go. The recipe for the cable, it's just one wire, mix one cable, code that. Here, put it in, in our, in the appropriate machine. We know which one that is because we named it as such. And now when we go request assemblers, we need four more. I'm sure we'll need at least these four. It will, let's see, here, say to craft 91. Now this crafting process will take a fair bit of time because covering wires is actually not very fast. Well, it'll take a little over a minute. In my world, waiting a minute for crafting sucks. Uh, there are ways to make this faster, including like running multiple machines to service a crafting request, or just running on higher tier machines, but for now we'll leave good enough alone, I think. Waiting a minute, it's, it sucks, but it doesn't suck enough that I want to do something about it. When placing assemblers, I also like to check to see whether or not there's a preferred circuit to go in them for recipes that don't otherwise care. So for the storage component here, it doesn't care about the circuit, but maybe there is a circuit number that is used more common than other in redstone assemblers. So I just do a scroll through here and see what we run into. One or zero, what's the difference? Oh, one makes a flux point, one makes a flux plug. But I believe, yeah, you can arbitrarily craft between the two. So that I don't really care. So let's finish scrolling through here. I see no, no other circuits. So we're free to choose either one or zero. And it really doesn't matter. I've been continuing to add machines to our ME system here. There's now a compressor, laser engraver. Those might be the new ones, but I think it's time to test to see what more I need to do. So the way I like to test this is just to theoretically order a lot of an item and see what it gets stuck on. So it doesn't know how to make plates, foils, wafers, wires, quartz glass, and foils. All right, so let's start with plates and foils. Both plates and foils are made in bending machines, and they are both good candidates to run in parallel because they're tasks that you might sometimes see a thousand plates at once. And if you make a thousand plates in a single bending machine, let's say you want a thousand stainless steel plates, right? It's three seconds each. That's well, it's three seconds at LV, but we're overclocking to HV, so it's about one second maybe. But still, that's a thousand seconds of waiting. I don't want to wait a thousand seconds. So to work around that, if you have, say, four metal benders working on it, then it takes 250 seconds. That's much better. And I took a quick glance through these recipes. They are, I didn't see any that were higher than MV tier. So if we just make our metal benders HV, that they can do every single metal bender recipe. Um, now that's not like quite completely true because the way I'm distributing items will make it unsuitable to make these dense plates because uh, I can't guarantee that nine plates at once go into each slot. But um, it's still, by distributing it, we make it faster for the important bits. The second thing to keep in mind is that foils all use program circuit four, whereas plates all use program circuit zero. So they have to be run on different metal benders. The setup for the machines is a little bit more complicated because I do want to distribute it across multiple machines. So for now what I'm doing is I'm processing each of plates or foils in four HV bending machines. Depending on how plate and or foil heavy the late game is, we might need more machines or a higher tier or both. But for example, like in Omnifactory, I think by the by the late game I was servicing plate requests with something like eight 
maybe they were UV, maybe they were ZPM tier, I don't recall, but there were eight definitely very high tier bending machines. But I also don't foresee plate demand to be quite as high in this pack. So this is our starting point, we can expand it as we go. Anyways, another thing I, I want to keep in mind is that I will definitely need more than nine different types of plates, and each interface can only hold nine patterns. So I want to make sure I have I leave other sides of this chest open to slap more interfaces on later. So uh, one side has to be, well, it doesn't have to be, but one side is my connector to actually pull items out of it. You can use a phantom face for that, but um, yeah, that leaves four other sides, I guess, because one side is my cable, but uh, four other sides for patterns, that's 36 patterns. If we need more than that, we can get clever with phantom faces and, and other things, but I expect 36 patterns will be enough. So all that's left is to configure the pattern and put our circuits into our machines. So this is zero, so the zeros go on this side and the ones go on the other or rather the fours go on the other side. The way the conduits work is that the interface, which is where the final product has to go, is insert on blue. The chest, which is where the interface puts items into, is extract on brown. I'll talk about the number of extraction speed upgrades later, and then on each of these machines it's, or this is extract on brown rather, each machine is insert on brown, extract on blue. So there's a bit of a conundrum when it comes to how many extraction speed upgrades you want to use because, well, it, it has to be in round robin mode, but I think that's the default. Nope, that's not the default. Make sure it's set to round robin mode. Anyways, the number of extraction speed upgrades kind of determines how it distributes the items. With zero, it does four items at a time. With three, it, you know, it's plus four items per tier or per upgrade. If you have zero upgrades, it distributes items most evenly, right? Right now, if I were to order 16 plates of a type, all 16 will go into the same machine. That's not very evenly distributed. However, a problem with using zero item or zero upgrades is that if you order plates that are made fast enough, you don't have all the machines running at a time. In fact, let me demonstrate instead of just mentioning that. So I think aluminum plates make very quickly. So we'll use that as our demo. Aluminum plates craft in 1.3 seconds each at LV, which means at HV this number is, I don't know, half a second, give or take. So let me show you what happens if I don't have any extraction speed upgrades in here. And I order, I don't know, uh, yeah, sure, let's go with 100 aluminum plates. They fill this chest as expected, but not every machine is running. In fact, you can see, uh, you can there's like a subtle difference between the running and not running graphic. Only about one machine is running at a time, because that's the limit at which we are extracting items from here. So by putting more extraction upgrades, we fix that problem with stuff like aluminum. Now when we order 100 aluminum plates, most of the machines are running uh, not quite 100% of the time. Uh, in fact, why are you only extracting one item at a time? Is it? Hold on, let, let's, let's take a closer look at that behavior. That didn't quite look right. Order 200. These will get used. The interface is being incredibly slow at jamming items out into here, and I think that's actually because I don't have enough crafting coprocessors on my crafting CPU. Each crafting coprocessor lets it jam out one extra item per, per unit time, per operation. So I guess until I get more coprocessors, this is a kind of bad demonstration, but I hope you kind of understand where I'm getting with this. Um, by if your extraction is too slow here, you're bottlenecked by how fast items get taken out of this chest and put into the machine. But if you have too many extraction speed upgrades, if you fill this whole stack, then if I were to order 32 plates, especially if I order 32 of a slower crafting plate, the titanium, in fact, I can even order up, to, let's say 60 of them with a full stack. When 60 items get dropped in here, they'll all get put into the same bending machine. Now, of course, at the moment, that's not actually the case because our our interface is slow. But later, when we have more crafting CPUs, that will become a problem. So it's about finding a happy-ish medium, and I'm just going to settle for three extraction speed upgrades. Is it the best number? Eh, maybe, maybe not. But uh, that's a number I pick. And one more thing, on the bending machine, or the, uh, what are these called? 
the foils side of the bending machines, I put a few extraction upgrades on the machines because each operation is one plate makes four foils. So there's four times as many items to extract as there are on the, uh, on the plate side. Although I think in general, foils take longer to make than plates. So that kind of cancels out at least a little bit. Let's see, metal bender. Making foils takes 2.4 seconds. No, I guess it's the same. Making the plates also takes 2.4 seconds. All right. I'm doing a similar setup with my wire mills to make, well, wires. But I remembered a trick that I did in basically every series. And that is when encoding your recipes, it doesn't have to be one to one. It has to be the right ratio, but I can say 64 copper ingots makes a stack and a half, or two stacks of copper wire. That way I get around the problem of the interface stuffing items out slowly because it stuffs out 64 copper ingots at a time. So I'm going to do a similar thing with all of these plates, maybe not like the platinum plates, but the plates that you use in any significant quantity, I'll just make them, you know, one stack of ingots makes one stack of plates and that solves the problem of the interface being too slow. I still will want to add more coprocessors to my crafting CPUs, but at least this means that uh, it, this will not be an immediate problem. Once again, let's try requesting a bunch of 64Ks to see what's left to do. So I'm missing ingots because I still haven't set up automated ore processing. Uh, i am kind of been putting that off for no good reason. It shouldn't be that difficult, I just haven't done it. So I'm not going to worry about not having ingots. Quartz glass, I've taken a look and it's a little difficult to make because I don't have an infinite supply of sand yet. Strangely enough. For now I can... It requires certus quartz dust, which I have automated already, but liquid glass is, you know, made from, well, sand. I assume sand and... Wait, I can... No, I don't have quartzite either. Uh, yeah, whatever. I don't have a good source of glass yet, is my point. So, until I have a cobble generator, I guess, like a cobble works, to make glass, I'm just going to leave it be and handcraft humongous batches at a time. Which is what I did before, but apparently my humongous batch isn't humongous enough to make 164k storage components. Good news is I don't think I need 164k storage components. And the other thing we don't have yet is wafers. So let's take a second to set up another blast furnace to make those. In fact, can I make the next tier wafer? A glowstone doped wafer. This is made in a blast furnace using nitrogen, silicon, and glowstone. Yeah, I see no reason I can't make this, right? My coils get hot enough. So how about let's extend our blast furnaces here one more uh, level, you know, one more row, whatever, and dedicate one to making glowstone wafers. So there's nothing that glowstone wafers can do that regular wafers can't. So these are just strictly better. Here's our next blast furnace. Much like before, inputs are one input per hatch. So we have glowstone dust. I just put the program circuit into one of them. It doesn't really matter which one it goes into because it's never consumed. Silicon dust in the other. Products come out from there. And then because this uses a fluid, nitrogen, that goes in the bottom. And it's uh, tucked away where no one can see it. But you're going to have to trust me that it's there. Or I can just show you. But there's really nothing to see here. There's a fluid export bus sending nitrogen. And then this system is turned off automatically once we have a certain number of glowstone dope wafers. But you'll notice that this doesn't actually craft wafers. It crafts bools. So I there's no reason not to cut the bools. Like the only thing you do with the bools is cut them. So I'm going to set up a cutting saw that automatically cuts the bools into wafers. Crafting these wafers takes forever. 10 minutes each at HV, and I'm running it at HV, so I get no overclocking. How much energy is this? Just under 6 million EU. Well, uh, with the help of our time in about our first one's almost done, because I need one so I can configure the export bus to export these. So 96, 97, that should be done in just a second. Now, this one cutting machine, I'm using it both to service on-demand tasks and the passive task of cutting these glowstone bulls. So, uh, I've, it's being supplied with lubricant with a fluid export bus. I have a mixer here that's making lubricant out of oil and redstone, so that's easy. And then I have a export bus. Let's put you... At some point I might need to put capacity cards in there, because eventually we'll want to cut the other silicon bowl types as well. 
but that will automatically insert silicon bulls into here, which get cut, and I think each one cuts into 32. Uh, I guess I don't get to know, because they automatically get shoved into the interface. Anyways, that's how I have it set. That's why I can set the glowstone dope wafer as the threshold here, because I'm automatically cutting the output. So that way, um, this turns off once we have, I have it set to 500, but you know, uh, let's set that a little higher. The, this, uh, these items are so slow to make that you never, ever, ever want to be waiting on this blast furnace specifically, because you'll be waiting 10 minutes for a silicon bowl. Anyways, that then allows us to change our, the recipe that we have for this printed silicon. Previously, I was using normal wafers, which are 1 to 4, but it's now 1 to 8 with glowstone wafers. This, uh, this used to be 1 to 1, but I think the most recent patch fixed that to give you more. Alrighty. Next up, let's automate the protection of dense cables because they're a component in our crafting units and we're going to need, you know, a whole bunch of these. So, dense cables are cover cables, are cover cables, our assembler with either 0 or 24, and polytetrafluoroethylene. So, we already make this fluid, we just have to send it over, but I guess it's just a matter of would I rather use circuit 0 or 24. Let's take a look at what our options are. So that's our thing here. Making crafting storages, all of these use 0, so that's a good reason to use 0, I guess. Uh, is there anything else that uses 24? Ooh, but superconductors use 24, and this is also, well, I don't know. Do we need superconductor cable anytime soon? We need them for qubits. Mm. All right, I guess we're going to need both 0 and 24 eventually then. But probably, I think it's a case of it doesn't really matter. Uh, let me just make sure these aren't 0 or 24. What's the difference between one tag and two tags here? Anyways, what's the second tag? Not consumed and... Oh, I see. This isn't a... This isn't actually a zero circuit. This is an unconfigured circuit. Let me show you what I mean. When you first craft a program circuit, it has, well, when you first craft and put it in your inventory, it has no metadata or has no MBT data. That is actually, this, this is like super technical, so you can completely ignore me if you like. That is what this tag is. The not consumed doesn't actually exist. But, um, if you were to take this circuit and set it, basically you see how right now it doesn't have MBT tags? If you set it to a number and back, it now has the zero MBT tag. So uh, now this circuit is actually, I, I'm, I'll, I'll test it, but I'm pretty sure the circuit I have no longer matches the configuration zero circuit that this recipe asked for. It's a little technical, let's test it. Uh, in fact, I have a cable on me, so all I have to do is head over to our manual assembler, which already has polytetrafluoroethylene in it, and, oh wait, oh, hold on, that doesn't count, I already had the 24 circuit in there. Oh no, it does match, never mind. Okay, um, so we do have the choice between 0 or 24. Uh, but zero is more immediate, you know, the, there's a more pressing use for circuit zero right now. I'll be making crafting storages way sooner than I'm making superconductor cable. So I guess a uh, long roundabout way of saying I will use circuit zero in the process of making covered cable. We're almost there. We can almost auto-craft our uh, crafting stuff. There's one more thing to do, and that's Stellar Alloy. So Stellar Alloy is from Stellar Alloy Ingots which is cooking stellar alloy dust. I'm gonna intentionally leave out the smelting step because I don't want to set up a temporary smelter. I want to just go straight to the multi-smelter once we have the infrastructure to make a fast multi-smelter. So for now, I'll just hand smelt in our massive tower of smelting doom. Um, so anyways, then stellar alloy dust is a mixer task. And what I did was I set up a mixer that always has energized glowstone in it, and then I just supplied the other stuff as needed. That way, this one mixer can also handle lumium dust. Uh, mixer tasks are pretty quick, 
So it is an eight free mixer, so it's capable of doing both recipes. So one machine, you know, two two birds. What's the saying? Two birds, one stone. Two birds, one mixer. I don't know. Anyways, I'm gonna request two hundred of this, and that'll just run through the mixer. While our mixer mixes, I figure let's take a look at how much end stone. Ooh, got a piece of wood. <laughs> has been uh, processed here. So remember, at the end of last episode, I filled this with I think it was ten stacks of end stone, and it went through nine and a half stacks of that. Why is it not picking up wood here? Oh, because this is full of ectoplasm. Whoops, I should put a home for ectoplasm here. All right, I'll fix that in a second. But uh, it appears like it went through yeah nine and a half of our ten stacks. It did one stack earlier, so ten and a half stacks of ore per half tank of mana which is how much i provided it that's not bad actually this is a pretty reasonable way of producing tongue state dust by the looks of things all i need is a consistent way to produce end stone which is the only real option is to transmute from moon turf um which i guess isn't that great because moon turf isn't renewable on its own i have to go mine that and if i'm going to mine moon turf i may as well mine end stone in well in the end so uh i don't know it's, this exists here. I can keep processing endstone through it. There's no reason not to, I guess. Uh, but yeah, it's just another option. And as I mentioned, I'm just smelting this in our tower by hand. Pretty soon. In fact, let's take a look at when I can make the multi-smelter. I think we can already make the multi-smelter multi-block. It's, what, nanoprocessors? Yeah. So I can already make this if I wanted to. However, the power of the multi smelter is really based on your coils. If you use tier one coils, you get level. So it smelts level times 16 items at a time. And energy discount is how much less energy it uses to do so. Um, so a level one multi smelter smelts 16 items at a time. That's fine. It's not spectacular. Nichrome, which is what we're currently at, smelts a stack of items at a time. That's fine. I could make tungsten steel. In fact, I have some tungsten steel. That's two stacks at a time. You know, all, all right. Now we're talking. But if we can get superconducting coils, we can do four stacks of items at a time. And it, because because of the energy discount, you effectively get a bonus overclocking tier. And these aren't actually all that bad to make, surprisingly enough. Um, superconducting wire is just made in the assembler with... LV pumps, we can make infinite of those. Tungsten steel plates, we already have tungsten steel. So it's just a matter of, at some point, I have to make either vanadium gallium, niobium titanium, or yttrium barium cuprate. And we already have nitrogen. So like we're reasonably close to making superconductors, which is why I haven't bothered with the uh, with setting up a plain old baby multi-smelter. Uh, pretty soon we'll have the, the fast multi-smelter. Anyways, I've managed to talk long enough that our stellar alloy is almost cooked. So the last thing we have to do is encode our, whoops, I'm out of patterns, our 64k crafting storage recipe. And I guess I need a few more patterns and, whoopsies, patterns in order to do so. Let's see. Oh boy, I'm out of iron and glowstone, huh? Huh, this is getting awkward. All right, we're going to have to set up that uh, ore processing system sooner rather than later, it seems. Anyways, 64k storage, crafting storage, this goes in our polytetrafluoral ethylene, PTFE assembler on zero, and now we should be able to auto craft these. So how many do I want? Let's set up, um, I don't know, let's start with four crafting CPUs, each with 64k. We're going to need four of these, all right, and some number of crafting coprocessors. Let's register. Oh, this is an easy recipe. And uh, maybe for now we'll give each crafting CPU... Uh, let's start with... Let's see. It has to form a, cu or a cuboid. So like a rectangular prism, I guess. So we can either do... Let's do a 2x2x2. Two by two by two. So we need 7 total things. Or 8 total things. So 7 of them will be coprocessors. So we need 7 times 4, so 28 coprocessors, and I guess minus 1 because we already have one. Um, and I guess I'll make some more epoxy circuit boards too.
These I'm making by hand for now because the process is slow and you, I don't really want to do it on demand. Uh, later, I'll set up a process that automatically background crafts these. But until then, I'll just keep doing my batch crafting. You know, I'm making four stacks at a time. Crafting is done, so it's time to upgrade our system here. I'm not going to put any crafting monitors on these just because I still think they're useless. You can view your crafting tasks just fine from any crafting terminal. So, let's see. You know what, if I put this here, I have room to expand, right? Room to expand is good. You never know where you're going to need bigger crafting computers. And uh, crafting CPUs are one of the things you will almost definitely have to expand throughout every playthrough as recipes get bigger and more complicated. All right, so now we have four crafting CPUs, which means we can do four crafting tasks at a time. How spiffy. Um, what did I... Oh, right, I have a bunch of these left over because I meant to make this too tall. And now that this just means it can do... The crafting CP or the crafting system can do eight tasks at a time. You get one task by default for existing, and then you get an additional one per crafting CPU, or rather per crafting coprocessor. Since we went through all the effort of setting up 64k crafting components, let's also switch over to digital storage. Um, let's start with two drives, maybe? We don't have to store everything in digital storage, but for items that we have a reasonable number of, it'll be good. So I think I'll swap most, if not all, of our modular storages here over to digital storage drives. But I will also add some of these, I believe they're called junk storage, junk storage units, uh, if I can craft these. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'll be able to make these now. Uh, it looks like it's a bit of nested crafting, but these junk storage units, it's, as it shows there in the tooltip, they hold 200, they store normally non-stackable items, but they let them stack. And they hold 270 different items per, per item block. So it's what I'm using here to store my enchanted books. But uh, this makes very good storage for items that normally take up a lot of different item types. So like all these hammers, because they don't normally stack, they go into this junk storage unit. And effectively this holds 270 items per for a rather low cost. Whereas storing them into the digital storing them into storage drives, these drives only hold 64 different item types per um per what I don't even know what you call these things. Per cell. And you can only fit 10 cells into a drive. Anyways, did I begin crafting drives? I did. So, drives and cells. Let's make 20 of these. Aha! And because I have four crafting CPUs now, I can craft two tasks two tasks at once. How spiffy. Now, I expect this one will take forever because there's a few really slow crafting tasks in here. These printed silicons and these printed logic circuits take a long time each. So um, I think I'll start this craft here, but we'll just let it run and because this is the end of the episode. So we'll start up next episode swapping over our storage to digital storage. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode and I hope to see you in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.